Hello everyone and welcome to day one, day one of official um, class beginning. So we're going to start the day off um, by introducing, I'm going to introduce to you some of my helpers here. Um, helpers come in. We have one. Nessie. Nessie. What's the other one? Bessie, Nessie's cousin. Yes, that's Bessie, Nessie's cousin. So, um, and then Reagan, my helper, my helper, right? Okay. <laughs> she um, will be making um, some various uh, appearances. But to get started, today we are going to be talking about the military. No more of that. Okay. Today we're going to be starting um, the chapter, chapter five, the military and diplomatic role of Canada and Brazil in the Second World War. If you will remember, we left off and we talked about the role that the United States played, how increasingly Roosevelt and the diplomatic role and the diplomatic role essentially that Roosevelt accomplished during World War II was multifaceted. We also talked about how uh, essentially what ends up happening is that Roosevelt ends up over a period of time in these diplomatic meetings gaining more and more in, uh, influence and power to the point in which he's essentially the main player and the main role and taking the main role in these diplomatic meetings. We talked about some of the various um, the, the various operations that took place. Operation Overlord was one of them. Operation Husky. Uh, as a result of some of these diplomatic meetings that included in many instances Churchill and also Roosevelt and at a few of the later meetings also Stalin. We also know that by the end of the war that Roosevelt passes on and Truman takes his place and Truman and Stalin have a very different relationship than Roosevelt and Stalin had. Now we're going to sort of filter in that knowledge that we have already maintained and hopefully gained. We are going to filter in the knowledge of Canada and Brazil during World War II. And that's where we, where we will begin. So for today, we're going to focus on a few pages that I will post on Manage Back. We're going to go over page 110 through 113 as a start. I'm going to try to keep these down to 15 minutes so that um, you're not on here listening to me for more than 15 minutes. I'm gonna try my best um, so I can see the timer in front of me. We're already at three, so I'm gonna get started with that. First off, on the pages that I will post for you, on page 117 is a chart that summarizes the main points of Canada during World War II. And this chart is entitled Canada's Military Role in the Second World War. And if you'll note that it starts all the way on the side, on the right hand side if you're looking at the text, it goes from Canada in 1939 all the way around the wheel to the end of the war. Today's key points were include Canada 1939, declared war on Germany, the 10th of September, 1939. They had a tiny armed forces uh, grouping. In fact, all of their forces, all three forces at the time were limited, but grew as the war grew. The Air Force, for example, trained more than 50,000 pilots in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. <coughs> Uh, the uh, the Canadians had approximately 250,000 250, personnel by the end of the war. The army had 700,000 personnel by the end of the war. Fought in Hong Kong, Sicily, and Italy. The main some of the main points here that we're going to talk about is that the Canadian, the leader of the Canadian Armed Forces, essentially wanted the trained Canadian. Um, military personnel to see more action and he pushed to have 
the Canadian military personnel involved more heavily in the Mediterranean um, theater, which he eventually does um, receive. And then we're going to talk about how the army was involved in Dieppe. And here they lost 900 men and 2,000 prisoners were taken uh, as a result of the Dieppe raid. Tomorrow we will talk about D-Day and the end of the war. But keep in mind, this refers to Canada's military role in the Second World War. So once again, we're focusing on Canada's military role in the Second World War. I'm also going to point out that this particular section of the chapter is not mainly about ideas, but it is about numbers, right? And I want to make sure I get these numbers right. So I'm going to be referring to the text on several occasions because there are specific numbers um, in fact, most of this section involves heavily statistics and numbers, so I'm going to be referring back to those so that I get them right. You should at this point have your graphic organizer out. If you don't use the graphic organizer, you should be um, getting ready to take notes as we start. And today's objective is explain, Owl will be able to explain Canada's military role during the Second World War. Objective once again, OWLs will be able to explain Canada's military role in the Second World War. And I was gonna tell you something else and then I completely forgot. So hopefully you have all that ready um, and uh, hopefully I'll remember as I go through this because I don't remember what I was gonna tell you. So, as you know, Canada was an independent country and part of the British Empire and Commonwealth. The Canadians had a very close relationship with Britain. Um, by 1939, uh, you know that essentially the United Kingdom, Britain, is going to declare war on Germany because of the invasion of Poland. The invasion of, the, the invasion of Poland is the key uh, to the start of World War II. Why? Essentially because the uh, British had promised to, if Poland was, was invaded, to come to Poland's aid. And indeed, Poland was invaded by the Nazis. And at this point, this engulfs um, Europe as sort of a, I don't want to say a domino effect happens, but again, the alliance system sort of falls in the pl into place. Not to the extent we see in World War I, but the alliances that are formed bring um, Britain in to help um, Poland. Does she entirely help Poland right away? No, but it kicks off a system of alliances that will eventually lead us to the cataclysmic debacle that is um, World War II. And I say debacle because of the millions of people who lost their lives. And really, there's even better words we could use for that. So when the UK declared war on Germany, on the 3rd of September, 1939, there was a two-day debate in Canadian Parliament. And during this debate, there was, um, there was fierce sort of goings over on how Canada should respond to this. But as you know, Canada and Britain are very close and there was a declaration of war issued um, by both houses on Germany and was signed by the British government on the 10th of September 1939, which then brings Canada into World War II. There are many contributors to World War II by Canada's armed forces. There are the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army, all of which are going to help aid World War, uh, the British in World War II, and then subsequently the combined Allied forces, because as we know, World War II does not start officially for the United States until we are bombed at Pearl Harbor. So the Air Force contribution to, the Canadian Air Force contribution to World War II is, is as follows. In September of 1939, the Royal Canadian Air Force, also known as the RCAF, had about 4,000 servicemen, uh, of whom only 235 at the earliest, 1939, were pilots. pilots. 
It also had 275 aircraft, but only 19 were considered, considered quote, modern. So they had not modernized their, their, um, <coughs> their, their bombers at this point, their aircraft were not modernized. But as the war goes on, as I said, we will see some definite changes to that. Shortly after the beginning of the war, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan was established. This is called the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, and this was established. It was based in Canada and comprised of the UK, Canada, and other Commonwealth dominions, which offered training programs for air crew. So other parts of the United Kingdom um, are also coming together to train different people and persons for this war. In fact, this Commonwealth, I'm sorry, in fact, this Commonwealth Air Training Plan successfully trained about 50,000 pilots. Half of these approximately were Canadian. And a further 80,000 crew or air crew, such as navigators, serial gunners, I'm sorry, aerial gunners, bombard, bombard, <laughs> I can't say this word bombardiers and flight engineers from 1940 to 1945. So they were very successful in this training program and getting men, and in some instances, as we'll discuss, women in part to collectively combine together to form this air force to help um, the Allied powers during World War II. By 1945, in fact, the Royal Canadian Air Force had 86 squadrons and 249,000 personnel, of which 17,000 were women. They played a considerable part in the Allied advance across Europe, among other success successful campaigns. In addition, thousands of Canadians fought in the British Royal Air Force, and this was a significant contribution to the war effort. So not only did Canada contribute her own personnel to this Air Force, the Canadian Royal Air Force, but Canadians also participated in the British Royal Air Force. Um, remember, there's a close tie, very close tie to Britain that we've talked about before. So not only were Canadians contributing to their own Air Force, but many Canadians, as I said, were contributing to the Royal British Royal Air Force as well. In fact, the Canadian Royal Air Force retained its own identity in the UK and its air crews saw active ser service in almost every theater in the war. Its number six group in Bomber Command suffered more than 4,200 air crew deaths in the heavy bombing campaign against Germany between 1943 to 45. Some Canadian pilots and naval personnel did serve in Asia but it was only after the war in Europe ended that large numbers were transferred there. So keep in your mind, the war ends in Europe before it ends in the Pacific theater, right? Because we, the United States has to drop, uh, the Truman, Truman elects to drop the atomic weapons in Asia before they unconditionally surrender. On the civilian front, Canada pr produced more than 16,000 aircraft of various types. And President Franklin Roosevelt has been quoted as saying, Canada is the aerodome of democracy. During the war, 232,632 men and 17,030 women served in the Royal Canadian Air Force and 17,100 lost their lives. And that includes, I believe, men and women. Let's talk briefly about the Navy because we're getting close to that mark. <coughs> <coughs> At the beginning of the war, the Royal Canadian Navy only had approximately 1,800 servicemen and 15 ships. Although small, it was efficient and well-trained. It had to be, right? Because it's, uh, the, its close relationship with Britain would lend to that. Britain is the master of the sea, essentially, and Canada is going to um, model herself, albeit on a slighter scale, because of um, the relationship that Britain and Canada had. Later, 
these ships and numbers increased to more than 400 ships, and they were compromised mainly of destroyers. These vessels were used primarily for anti-submarine warfare and convoy during the, the Battle of the Atlantic, which we've talked about before. The German U-boats, uh, the German submarines were very, very, very vicious in the Atlantic. And so these destroyers, along with um, the uh, escorts that we talked about with the United States and some other factors played a role in um, keeping the U-boats at bay. Uh, caveat, I would also argue the development of, of sonar helped to um, curtail the amount of damage that was done in the Atlantic because it was very heavy at first um, against some of these ships that were trying to get needed supplies to um, the Allied forces, especially Britain. So these vessels were mainly used primarily for anti-submarine warfare. Um, some of these ships did serve in the Pacific, but they were used as a defensive force. By the end of the war, the Royal Canadian Navy had lost almost 100,000 personnel and had become the third largest navy amongst the Allied forces. Canadian industries had built during this time period more than 400 merchant ships, and between 1939 and 1945, um, these ships had completed more than 25,000 trips across the Atlantic, which is amazing. On to the army. <coughs> Canada had a small army, about 5,000 5, or so well-trained soldiers at the start of, a, of the war. Uh, its artillery was pretty light, with only 16 tanks, four anti-aircraft guns, uh, four anti-aircraft gun guns and two anti-tank um, guns. It was supported by a militia of 50,000, but these were also consequently ill-equipped. Now the numbers change vastly because by the end of the war, and we're talking about 1945, more, more than 700,000 men had enlisted in the Canadian Army and, and, Around 15,000 women served in the Canadian Women's Army Corps in the European and Pacific theaters of war. The first part of the Canadian Active Service Force, numbering 7,400 of all ranks, sailed for Britain in late December 1939. And then by February 21 of 1940, its strength had grown to 10, or excuse me, 1,066 officers and 22,238 other ranks. It was ready for service in France by the spring of 1940. Although some senior officers were sent to France, they returned to Britain following the Dunkirk evacuation. So as you can see, at first Canada started out very light um, as far as perhaps its Navy, its Army and its Air Force goes. But as the war progresses, they are building quite rapidly their forces and they are contributing um, pretty fantastically to the efforts of the Allies during World War II. Uh, so after the surrender of France, remember France falls to the Nazis in, very, um, in a very quick manner, and it's by 1940 that France actually falls to the Nazis. The Canadian army um, was basically spent the, um, spent, I can't remember how long, spent uh, a good, a significant amount of time training to help defend its borders and boundaries for an attack if that should happen from Germany, right? So France falls and they're scared, the Canadians are scared essentially that they might too be attacked. So the Canadian army spent 1940 and 1941 training and helping to build defenses and guarding beaches ready for a quote, anticipated German invasion. Um, more forces, Canadian forces, were also sent to Iceland to assist the British occupation. They stayed approximately six months before being sent on to Britain in October of 1940. And by the end of 1940, there were 57,000 members of the Canadian Army in Britain and 125,000 by the end of the following year. Many of these troops, in fact, two battalions were sent to 
basically help defend Hong Kong against the Japanese. If you will remember from our previous studies, the, the area of Hong Kong and China had um, been held as a British sort of enclave. Um, here, these Canadian forces were sent to defend Hong Kong against the Japanese. Um, and basically, many of these soldiers were uh, captured by the Japanese at the end of that year. Um, the end of that year being 1941. Many of these soldiers were held for a good length of time as prisoners of war under the Japanese. In fact, until 1945, they are held as prisoners of war. And as a result of this, 267 uh, Canadian soldiers die in Japanese prisoner of war camps. As the war progresses, basically Canadian commanders are essentially asking, they're begging to send their trained forces into battle, more heavily um, armed situations. They basically wanted to contribute to the, the massive invasions that were taking place that were organized at these dip diplomatic meetings with Roosevelt and Churchill especially. Um, uh, invasion Operation Overlord, for example, Operation Husky, um, the invasion of North Africa. Uh, the Canadians are looking at this and they're saying, look, we wanna be involved. We wanna contribute militarily. It's at this point that especially the Canadian um, army officers I don't want to say beg, but they press the Allied commanders for a piece of the Mediterranean campaign. Um, it is here that they decide, collectively the Allied forces decide, um, to use Canadian forces in the assault on Dieppe. And this was because Canada's military commanders felt that their fully trained troops had seen too little action. So I am at... 21 minutes and that is I'm gonna cut it off here okay um, I will finish up this tomorrow I will try to go more quickly so that um, we can get through this this is just the first day a lot of this stuff I had to kind of refer back and forth to because it's a lot of numbers but I'm hoping as we move forward this will be more quick and I will not have to only get through a certain amount so for those of you reading along, we, get, we went from page 110 to 112, okay? And I'm going to end there. Love you guys. Hope, um, hopefully next week we'll have Zoom running and we can um, see each other face to face and chat face to face. Uh, send me a message. Let me know how you guys are doing. Love you. Miss you all. Hasta luego.